Yes, thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you very much. Sorry for this hassle. This is always a bit of a, a bit of a trick. I'm lecturing quite a bit, but still, every time it's new systems and it's it's a, it's it's quite a challenge. Very happy to be here, and um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the future of frankincense in a changing world. And I would like to focus a little bit on keeping frankincense resources. So, what is it kind of things that we need to know and do? And um, I'm Franz Bongers from the, the University of Wageningen in the Netherlands have been working about uh, more than 20 years in frankincense in the Horn of Africa. And uh, the last couple of years, I'm, I'm expanding to other places as well. So um, uh, I'm happy to share some of my information with you, you here. And so the ESO, Environmental Society of Oman and frankincense, I think in general, they, they focus, ESO focus on natural heritage of Oman. And I think that's a good thing to do with most focus on animals. And since 2009, ESO works also on frankincense, as, uh, as uh, she mentioned just before. And I think that is a good thing to do because internationally, Oman is, of course, for, for several reasons, but also very well known as the land of frankincense. And here in the bottom, you see a frankincense tree. And one of the major products, and that's the resin that is being used to, to, to burn and fumigate and, and, and smelt. And, um, and let me then start with, with addressing what frankincense is. So frankincense is the resin from the trees and shrubs of the genus Boswellia. And the genus is a whole group of species within the same family, within, within the same group. Well, that's, that's called the genus, in fact. So it's Boswellia and the, 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 the resin can be used for different purposes. One aspect is the raw resin that everybody knows, and that's being burnt in churches and in coffee ceremonies and in fumigations. And it's, it's, it's well known in, in history, of course, but it's also, and increasingly so, transformed into essential oils and into medicinal products and, that's, uh, and, and into perfumes, of course. So many perfumes in Europe, for instance, but worldwide also, and also several ones in, are, that are being produced in Oman have frankincense in them. For all these products to be used at the end, we need to have the resource, the basic resource. And the basic resource is trees and shrubs in the countries where frankincense is produced. In total, we have 24 species of frankincense. And I, I, and I have here in my hand a new book that has just came out from Mats Tulin from Sweden, where he, uh, it's a monograph on the species of frankincense. Very interesting. 24 species of which five are the major frankincense producing species. All the other ones, the white ones here below, that you see, let me see if, if I can have, yeah, you can see this probably. Um, uh, that's all kinds of other species. And of course, the most species are on Socotra Island, a very tiny place uh, that's part of Yemen. And, and it's in, in just in front south of Oman, but that's where about 10 or 11 different species are found. But the frankincense species are these five, Boswellia serrata, Sacra in Oman, Papyrifera in the Horn of Africa and, and, and all through, through Cameroon. Frerian in Somalia and Neglecta in Ethiopia and also in the Horn of Africa. And so when we look at these five species, where are they found? This is a map. Uh, here we see India, that's one species. Here the yellow one, that's Sacra. Here Dofar, Yemen, and, and, and some in Somalia, Somaliland. And then there is Neglecta, which has a very wide distribution. Um, here we see Freyriana which has a very relatively small distribution. And the wide distribution here is Boswellia papyrifera. I would like to talk a little bit about Boswellia sacra and then later on go a little bit to, to Boswellia papyrifera because that's where I've been working on most. And he, here, this is, this, this is sacra, this is a famous drawing. And uh, here we see in this beautiful landscape in, 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 Darf, in, in Dofar, where I was a couple of years ago, um, where this is the, the Boswellia sacra tree, the beautiful flowers and all the resin. And this is the famous 
green, big, big resin hojari uh, frankincense coming from that area. When we look at trees, there are trees, there are flowers here. We see here some fruits. We see here some old fruits and small individuals. So, so germinating seeds. And the interesting thing is in many of these cases in, in, in Dofar, we see that these are germinating on bare rock. So we, we don't see any soil. In some cases we do, but in some cases we don't. And still the trees are germinating then they find their way. They do, they do develop and, and I have to say, relatively fast. I was there um, uh, at the end of 2018 and there were shoots of maybe a meter of that of the rainy season of that year, which is quite amazing. The other aspect is of course how to get the resin out of it. So this is trees of Boswellia sacra and they are scratched on the stem. So the resin is part of the stem. It's part of the bark. So some other species they have resin in the in the wood. The Boswellia species have resin in, in the bark, in fact. It's in, in most cases, it's, it's the inner bark. So here we see several uh, small scratches where then later on um, the resin is oozing out. They leave it for, for two weeks and then they come back and, and pick it up. And then you get these dry, these dry resin drops. This, this is, if it's still wet, it's oozing out. This, of course, is a very large area, just freshly, freshly cut. And in fact, this should, this is probably too big. So when we, when we go over in Dofar, then, then there are, there is a large variation, but in general, it's dry. And in general, when we, when we, we look at the landscape, the, the area is not very densely populated with trees. So, but the few trees that are there, in most cases are, species from the genus Boswellia. So in some of the, some of the bodies, it, the density is a bit higher, but overall, I, 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 I was used to the Horn of Africa. And, and, and so this is in general, it's quite low densities. But some of the trees you see here are maybe two, maybe eight meters tall. Um, this is an example where we, where we went after the, 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 the cyclones. <laughs> And there were many of these large trees that were just toppled over. But there are new small individuals in the area. So that's a, that's a good sign. So when we think about the future of, uh, of frankincense, we have to think about resources. Okay? Where is the, are there sufficient trees? Where are these trees? Are they regenerating? Are they growing? Are there new trees coming up? How old are these trees? When do they die, etc.? What, what, what about the quantity and the quality of the resin? Another aspect is we have to think about the product modification and value addition. That's another aspect that is very important. So, and that is an increasingly happening In fact, Maybe 20 years ago or 30 years ago, the majority of the frankincense was used as resin. And now the majority of frankincense is used in essential oils. Then we have to think about the demand. Why are people wanting this resin? For what uses? And how much? And we see over the last 10 years that this is, is, is I may say that it's exploding. The demand, when, we, when I see the demand now compared to, to 20, 25 years ago, is just incredibly big. And that puts a lot of pressure on the resource. Because if we need more, if we, if we demand more, or prices go up, or, um, or and both probably, or there is just more resin tapped in the field. And maybe the amount of resource is not big enough for that. And maybe then we have to think about how to improve this. So from a business point of view, we have to think in demand and value change and profit structures and in social and ecological responsibility, very important aspects. And then we have to think about the changing world, which is, which is vast at the moment. We have a lot of political change, maybe not so much at the moment in Oman, but in Somalia, in Somaliland, in Ethiopia at the moment, the war is in the area where the frankincense is growing. The border between Ethiopia and Eritrea, the border between Ethiopia and Sudan, that's all, I, might, I think it's like war, war zones. And, that's, uh, and that's, uh, that's one important aspect. 
The second aspect is the economical and the market change. So this, the way we do things, the connection of the world, um, the transport is, is, is made much easier. And many people in the, in the world have, have lots of money and want to use essential oils. So the demand is really changing. The third changing world aspect, I would say, is the societal change. So there is now increasing pressure for sustainability where do our products that we use come from? And here in the Netherlands, and that's in, 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 in many countries, most people have no clue where frankincense came from. Everybody knows frankincense because of the church, because of a thousand reasons, but they had no clue what frankincense was and where it came from. Now they know, and now they know there is a lot of pressure. And now they know that there is people want to have things more sustainable. The fourth aspect in the changing world for me is the climate change. So we see that this is happening and maybe this is also changing areas in these in the regions where frankincense are growing, where there's more droughts or, or more rainfall, etc. And maybe both is wrong. In some of the areas, in, in, in northern Ethiopia, for instance, there is more rain than there was before. In other areas, there's less. So for Boswellia Sacra in Oman, in the past, private companies were interested. They were interested in the perfumes, essential oils, the raw resin for business. And of course, Oman is the land of frankincense, so this is a big issue. So maybe 15 years ago, groups started to study this. The University of Nizwa has a big group. I have here, here a book from Professor al Rassi from the University of Nizwa and his group on the, on the biology of the genus they focus with their work on chemistry and medicinal issues. The botanical gardens are working on botany, the distribution, they work a bit on the resource. The government is putting attention to the Wadi Doka with support from UNESCO, of course. That's also about the resource. There is increasing information, not for nothing that the Frankincense Museum has been opened not too long ago. And I was, I was there in the, a couple of years ago and also I went to the north to Ubar, where there is another small museum. It's very interesting. It's all information for people. And when we see over the, the, the past couple of years, because of the increasing demand, there are increasing numbers of private companies who want to have a share of the possibilities of earning, earning a living, making a business. And part of, the, part of that is about the resource. So they start thinking about plantations, which by itself is good. And the ESO, of course, started in 2009 or 2008 with these su sustainable tapping issues and planting. And that's also about the resource. So the big message here is the demand is increasing. And that means overall, there is a much higher pressure on the resource. And there is a lot that we still need to know to, to, to fill uh, knowledge gaps. So let me tell you a little bit more, more about another species. Boswellia papyrifera. And Boswellia papyrifera is, is the species, is the frankincense that is being traded most internationally. It's bigger than Sacra, it's bigger than Serata, it's bigger than the other ones. So this is a really big thing. And, there, and it's growing, as you can see on the map, in Eritrea, Ethiopia, Sudan, Chad, and some other countries. It's also a beautiful tree. It's a beautiful, beautiful open forest. And, and while I was working on this one, I started to, to do my work uh, in Eritrea in the end of the 1990s. And then I went to Ethiopia for other projects and, and I found that this was the same case. So I developed this, this big research program and we got money from, from the Dutch government, from science foundations, from all kinds of, of sites. And we have this, what I call the frame, the frankincense, etc. dream team. And the dream team is, nine PhD students, and all of them are Ethiopians, except for one Eritrean and one postdoc. And there are many PhD, uh, uh, embassies, etc. And they all focus on what is happening in these resources. So they look at the seedlings, they look at genetics, they look at livelihoods, what are people doing in the field? How is this organized? Who is getting which shares? There is scenario studies, there is distribution, remote sensing. They look in the field on how trees are growing, um, is there is regeneration is not, how does it work? What is frankincense, where it's coming from, how it's produced in the tree? 
all these field-based elements uh, have been studied. And I'll, I'll share you a little bit of this one. So this is a study where we looked at 23 sites with populations of Boswellia, of frankincense trees in Ethiopia, Eritrea, and Sudan. And these small things that you see here with these numbers, one, two, three, four, until 23, these are, each of these is one population. And what we see here is here on the X axis is size. So this is a size like 40 centimeter DBH, a big tree, and there are a few individuals. And the, the smaller to this size we go, then there are smaller individuals and th these are the numbers. So it's a percentage. So everything in every side uh, of the left-hand side of the stipple line means small individuals in the population. And we see here, no small individuals, no small individuals, a few small individuals, no small individuals, etc. So most of these populations have no small individuals. This has implications because if there is no small individuals, there is no future. So what did we do? We went to, to, to look at on the ground what's happening. Why are there no small, small individuals? So we have four types of problems on the ground. One in general is conversion. So the forest is set over to agricultural land. It's changed to, to another land use. The second one is fire. And fire is important area where people live. There is fire because then there, there is cattle and there is new grasses, etc. So every area, in this case, Ethiopia, is set on fire every year. The third one is grazing. There are large numbers of cattle and large numbers of goats, and they all have to eat. And they eat grasses and plants and browsing and small plants, including small Boswellia plants, small frankincense trees. The fourth one is tapping. So tapping, because that brings some money, there is, there is extensive tapping. The more demand, the more tapping there is. So what we see here is that there is no regeneration, no small new plants, and the, and the populations are declining. When the populations decline, there is also declining frankincense yield, and I'll come back to that. But at the same time, there is changes, social economical changes. So change of control over the production, there is increasing contestation because who owns the land? Who owns the trees? In some of these areas, for instance, there is a, the land is owned by the government um, or even the land is owned private, but the trees on the land are owned by the government or owned by the concessionaires. So there is an increasing contestation there. Here we see an example. On the left-hand side, we see, we see a big frankincense tree with, uh, with tapping spots and people are changing the land for agriculture. This means that at the end, there is agricultural land and on this agricultural land, there are individual trees. These trees are fine, they can be tapped, they can be used, but there is no regeneration coming. So when these trees die, it's over. So what we have to think about is how to regenerate this. And so when, when so, so, so that is land use change. It's, it's changed from, from a forest or a wild land with wild trees into a agricultural land. Other areas where we see the forest, we see there is no regeneration. Here we see, for instance, one example. All the blue ones are frankincense trees. This is a large frankincense trees and this is a small tree. And when we see all the small trees in this, in this forest are all other species. So these are, are uh, all big uh, frankincense trees, like we see here in the pictures. They're all relatively big. They grow to a certain size and then they die, like people die. But if we don't have children, if trees don't have children, small children, seedlings and saplings, that's the end of the end, end of it. So the frankincense is phasing out of the system over time. It's a matter of time. And then of course, we want to know when is that a matter of time? What is happening? So how old are these trees then? And when did they stop regenerating? So when we think in terms of temperate zone areas, we think in, in terms of tree age, we think in terms of tree rings. So in the winter, the tree is not growing and it doesn't produce any new wood. In the summer in the, in the, in the, in the, or in the wet season, in the tropics, it is growing and it produces a ring. So we first had, first had to figure out whether there were tree rings in the system. And yes, for the species, there are tree rings. 
Um, and then we use these tree rings to age trees. And what we see here is on the left hand side, we see here the, the, the and, and if we know the age of the trees, we know for a certain population when these trees are born, because that's the age. And so for all this forest, for this whole forest, there is no regeneration in the past half century. So since the 1960s, there is no new trees coming in that survived until 2010. The mean age is 75, 71, and the maximum age is 100 years. If the mean age is, is 71, then in, in 30 years, almost half of the population is gone. This is in a lowland area, and this is same as happening in a highland area. And there are some other areas where we did the same thing. And in all cases, it's like half a century that there are no new um, individuals coming into the system. And then all of a sudden, in 2011, I entered, ended up after 10 years wandering around through all these forests, I found an area where there is regeneration, which is by itself interesting. So I, so I and others were very happy with that. And so when we look at these, these um, uh, uh, regeneration, of course, if we have to, to think in the future, we have to model this. And, and in some of these forests, we have been marking individual trees and following the survival. And we put that into an integration projection model with data on the growth of trees and reproduction and establishment. And then we modeled this. And then we saw that this one is like the times 50% of the tree. So 50% of the current population is, is uh, reached in less than 20 years. So the population is going backward very fastly. Here on the left hand side, we see that big trees have larger amount of yields. So we calculated the yield per tree and we, we combined these information into how much production is is possible. And also there in these models, it says that it's less than two decades before we have 50% yield loss. And all this yield loss, of course, is related to the standing trees that are there. No new trees coming in, then you have a trouble in the future. So that's a, that's a general principle. And of course, we also would like to know these, these general principles for uh, species in Somalia, in Oman, in Chad, and in other areas. We don't know. So in fact, even for Oman, we have no idea how fast individual trees grow because we have never looked at it. I personally think that in general is because for a long time, there was no need to look for it because there was enough frankincense available for the market. But now the market is increasing and now we need more information. Okay, so we have now to think about issues that we need to solve and what is needed for that. So we have this conversion to agriculture, to mining, fire, construction, wood. What we would need is create reserve sparks. What we would need is provide alternatives for humans, because if they cannot uh, use the land for agriculture, they need to have uh, alternatives. And then we have to think in, 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 in carbon or uh, payment for environmental services or honey or other products, or the international society has to pay for, for it. We have to provide alternative energy. In Ethiopia, for instance, 80% of the countryside is cooking on, on wood. So wood is an important thing. We need to think of plantations. And we have to do things on land grabbing. This is happening. So, so land is being, being sold or giving out in, in concessions to, to people. And that's not always the right way to do this. I I'll, 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 I'll cannot go into detail now here. Oh, yes. And the important thing is, of course, increased consumer awareness and pressure. If you think about grazing and fire, it's all about livestock. And fire is two ways. One is a side product of agriculture. So people burn their land and then, and then after, after, the, the, after the harvest, or it's fire before the tapping. Because in some areas, it's, it's people find it's a bit dangerous or the grass is like two meters high. I've been in these areas and it's easier to burn it and then enter for the tapping. 
So what we need is, is uh, serious fencing. We need to reduce herd size. We need to have fire breaks. And we need, of course, to planting and planting and protecting and maybe not total fencing, but fencing of individual plants, like, uh, like in other places is being done. And there's a lot of education and untraining needed. So when we think about the tapping, in many areas, it's too many spots, too many cycles, too deep, too rough. And that's devastating for the health of the tree and thus for the future frankincense. So what we need is reduce tapping spots. We, we need to reduce, to change the tapping cycles. Maybe we have to think about permanent tapping systems. Uh, there, there are several opportunities and possibilities. And we need to think in terms of rest years. So tap a little bit, tap a few years, and then let it rest. And maybe after 10 years, you rest it for five years or 20 years. And of course, there are guidelines. There are guidelines in Oman, like I, I, I show here. This is a guideline that is produced by the Environmental Society of Oman a couple of years ago. There are also guidelines in Ethiopia and also guidelines in Somaliland. The issue here in many cases is it's not that we do not know what to do. It's that we don't do it. And so then we, th we think in terms of, of incentives and education. Oh, sorry. The, the last part is that we also have to think about the whole chain. So it's not only about the resource and the management of the trees of the forest, but it's also about the resin quality and maybe upgrading. So in some countries, the resin is exported and in other countries, it's transformed into essential oil. And that means also that lots of uh, a large part of the of the gain, a large part of the of the of the of the profits, they are somewhere else and not on the ground uh, with in the areas where the resources are. Well, that's a devastating system in the, in the long term. So we have to think about ownership, land tenure, use rights, and trade rules and regulations. I think that's important. So what we can think about is we need more care with trees and forests. We need to change the collective incentives. We have to think about quality and not quantity of, uh, of, of, uh, of collection. So maybe we also have to pay tappers in a different way than we do now. We may have to need to follow the resin and who earns the money because we have to think in equity and gender. The upgrading in country, that's a possibility. Essential oils in country, trade control. We have to think about just rules and regulations, ownerships. There is, there is discussion about ICN red list and, and CITES trade arrangements. There's a possibility at least to think about what that would mean for the different species. And there is an increasing awareness by consumers. And I, and I personally think this increasing awareness and pressure by consumers is, a very, is very powerful because that's at the end of the day for many of these products is, to, is the end users who are paying for this. So if the pressure comes from them, there is a change. So, so what we did extensively for uh, this one species in, in uh, Boswellia papyrifera, um, we also thought about what do we know about these other species? Are these problems the same? And so here I, 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 I read, this is the trade. So the most important one is Boswellia papyrifera and Boswellia sacra is increasing again, especially in Somalia. Um, we think about habitat loss, grazing, over-exploitation of the resin, over-exploitation of the wood, the fire threat, insects, I didn't mention that, but some other time, and there, the lacking of regeneration. And for Boswellia papyrifera, it's all a yes. This is, and all these, these issues are happening. It's a problem. Oh, sorry. And uh, for some of the other species, the situation is different. In some cases, they have a problem. In other cases, it, they don't. But the general message here is that we really do not have sufficient details about uh, what is happening with these species because we have never looked at it in much detail. Of course, companies do it in their areas, et cetera, but that's not shared, shared, shared information. So that is something we have to think about collectively. And overall, I would say we need more care and more data for, especially for the other species. So I would be in favor of a research program. And what would we then need to be doing? We would need to have large scale inventories of the main species. We need to look at 
chain analysis of the trade. So follow the product, follow the money, follow the power, follow where things are going and what, what is happening. There are examples for other, uh, other commodities where this has created a lot of interesting information. We have to think in alternative production and production pathways, alternative production in the field. So at the moment, 95% is, is, uh, is from the wild. And maybe we, have, we can have two different streams, a domesticated plantation stream or a wild type. Can think about it. We can have different uh, uh, different uh, uses as well. And then, of course, the whole social anthropological policy issue is is, is very important. We need protected reserves, reserves, and then we have to think about where and what kind and what kind of variation we need to to put in. So that's a whole series of uh, work. And if you think in terms of how I would say this is work for a task force. And that's a combined from people from science, from companies, from NGOs, from governments, where they work together and where they are independent and independent of each of these, independent of companies, independent of NGOs, etc. Because otherwise you don't get the right information. And, and I see this when I talk to companies, in most cases, it's not easy to get information, hardcore information. Yes, the general principles, yes, but not the, the really hard data. And this would be needed to be funded in public-private partnerships, maybe with crowdfunding, because there is so many people have frankincense in their hearts, really in their hearts. If I say something about frankincense, I, my, my mailbox is swamped. There are, there are really many people who want to help, who want to do things. And, and there is this user-based funding that I, I mentioned already. So then to finalize, I have a few ethical questions, which re is related to sourcing. So if we think about frankincense, we think about the product. And the question is whether that's the only thing we need to think about. And I think that it's not the only thing. We also have to take care of biodiversity. We have to take care of ecosystem integrity. And, and all kinds of ecosystem functions, erosion control, etc. That's something we have to think about. We have to think about culture. At the moment, resin is out and essential oils is in. So everyone tries to, to transform the resin into essential oils and making bucks, big, big money. And the, uh, we, know, we know that the essential oil market is unsettable. But that means that it's for churches and coffee ceremonies and odors and fumigations. That's also something that we need. So we need, they need, these elements need their share as well. And half of the production is for local use. So if everything is going to, to essential oil buyers in the US or in Europe or, or in, 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 in the Middle East or in China or in Africa, then there is nothing left for local use. Do we want that? Is that, is that fair? We have to think about diversified pathways. So, so can we think about agriculture for mass production? Yes, we do for coffee and all kinds of forest products, which were before forest products and now are agricultural products. Frankincense could be the same. So then we have a separate, view, is a separate way of wild type frankincense and, and plantation type frankincense. We do not know the details about the quality of the product yet, but that's, but, but that's something for the near future. And I know that people are working on this. So the other thing is that we can think from the products. Do we, do we need other products? Yeah, and do we have byproducts? Now, for instance, if there is essential oil, there is 95% of the material is waste. Well, what is that waste? I hear, I hear in the newspapers that waste is something that does not exist. Waste is because we call it waste and not because it is waste. So what can we do with these other products? And then there are two final questions. How long-term can we think in this? We mentioned this 15, 20 years that, that the production is going, is, is halved in, in Boswellia papyrifera. Well, people get panicked on this. So how long-term how long do we want to think? And how fair do we want to be? Is it reasonable that a local producers in Kenya gets $1 per kilo 
and that on the international market is it's 15, 20, 25. And if you transform it into essential oils, it's hundreds. But still, one dollar is for the, 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 the producer and the people who take care of the land. How fair is that? So you have to think about this. So this is really the final one. It's my take home message. I still think that frankincense is in peril and it's across species, but it's for different reasons. So for frankincense uh, from Boswellia papyrifera, we know there is no regeneration. There, there is a problem with the reproduction. In some other species, that's not the case, but there it's, it's the social aspect of the production, which is not sustainable. The, the money, the fair share, the, the position of women uh, in that. So the production is not sustainable. And maybe there are a few examples where it is, where people claim it is, but I still have to be convinced that it is. But I have to make this thing, it's different across species. So it's not one thing for all the species of frankincense. It's different for every species of frankincense, and maybe it's even different for every state of frankincense. So we need action, we need to join hands, we need integral research programs, and we need to, to have public-private partnerships to be able to solve this. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. And that would be a shame for the future of frankincense, I would say. Thank you. Yes, here, here in the bottom, you can see that there is the global frankincense alliance.com that's the source of, of more information and of course from there you can read all kinds of other things thank you thank you very much uh professor bongers for this uh, insightful and factful presentation there's quite a lot to take from it and um it's quite alarming to see what's happening to frankincense uh, trees in various regions of the world. And it would be, I'm very convinced that we need more information about the frankincense trees in Oman. And uh, that's just a very solid case that you presented there for us to take this forward. Um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to uh, post them on the chat box and uh, I'll be very happy, we'll be very happy to answer them in whichever way we can. Uh, Professor, would you like to stop recording now, perhaps? Yes, that's fine. Uh, then I just say pause or just stop and then it, it is going somewhere. Is, is that correct? It should go on your computer, yes.